Mr. President, last Friday I visited uh, Heartland Alliance, a nonprofit organization in the city of Chicago, which for more than two decades has provided care for immigrant children who are classified as unaccompanied children. The day that I visited last Friday was my second visit to one of their nine facilities in the city of Chicago. Very few of any people in that city, a great city that I'm proud to represent, even know that Heartland Alliance exists. You see, the children are kept in residential neighborhoods, in places that look like ordinary homes. The only giveaway is the security fence around the building is a little higher than most of the fences in the neighborhood. That's the only difference. And in this busy neighborhood, there's a house with dozens of children inside. On the day that I was there, Heartland Alliance of Chicago had 66 children under their care who had been separated from their parents by our federal government over the last several weeks. They were separated under President Trump's zero tolerance policy. Two thirds of these 66 zero tolerance children were under the age of 13. 22 of the children Zero tolerance children separated from their parents were under the age of five. I went into the facility's nursery where the infants and toddlers were being held, and I couldn't imagine for a moment what it must have been like when someone reached over and took that infant out of the arms of that mother and decided to transport that baby thousands of miles away. That's what's happened. I met two little girls. I won't use their names, but they're ages five and six. And when they walked in the room together, holding hands, these tiny little girls, I thought immediately they were twins. They had a Bam Bam hairstyle. Maybe somebody will remember what I'm referring to from an old television show. And they were as cute as could be. And they were holding hands as they walked in the room. I thought at first they were twins. And then I realized one was a little bit older than the other, and so I started asking questions, their names and their ages and where they were from, and they were answering for one another. And at the end of it, we asked, are you sisters? They said, no, amigas, friends. They, like so many other kids in this situation, were clinging to anything that created a connection in their desperate little lives. I brought with me some handmade cards that kids from my staff and friends had made to send to them. They were just pieces of construction paper with stickers inside, the kind that kids love to make and love to receive. And I went around and asked each of them if they'd like to take one. They took them like they were Christmas toys and they hung on to them. Another connection in a life that sadly had become disconnected from the reality of their family. I asked the staff at Heartland Alliance about these zero tolerance kids. And I said, could you find the parents of these kids if you needed to for a medical emergency? Well, we could try. In some cases, we could. But in many cases, in the words of the agency, it's like a scavenger hunt. You see, their parents may be moved from place to place. And if something happened, a medical emergency, it would be difficult to find that parent. I thought about that. My little granddaughters and son, six, seven, eight years old, if they were brought into a hospital with some serious medical condition, the first thing that the doctor wants to know, what is the history? Has this child had a problem before? These people don't know. No files are coming with the children that have medical history. And there's no way to contact, in many cases, their parents in an emergency situation. This was a gut-wrenching visit. It's still with me today. It's just hard to imagine that the government of the United States of America would forcibly take children away from their parents, parents who are seeking a chance at asylum and safety from violence and persecution. And I'm angry, too. I'm infuriated that not only have these families not been reunited, but there doesn't seem to be an effective plan in place to bring these kids back to their parents. 
How did we reach this point? How in the history of this country did we reach the point where on April 6th, Attorney General Jeff Sessions announced the Trump administration had created a new zero tolerance policy for prosecuting border cases? There's no requirement in law to prosecute every border case criminally, none. These cases can be handled under civil law and families can be kept together under the law. But this administration chose to call every person at the border a criminal, even those who were fleeing violence and death threats and seeking a chance at asylum. And as soon as they alleged that that adult at the border was a criminal, then they could rationalize separating the children from these possible criminals, when in most cases, the overwhelming majority of cases, the only possible crime was the fact that they showed up and presented themselves at the border. As far as we know, more than 2,300 children have been taken away from their parents by the U.S. government as a result of this zero tolerance policy. They've been transferred to facilities and places far away, sometimes thousands of miles away, like Chicago. If the federal government separates children from parents while the family's in custody, I believe our government has a solemn obligation to ensure that each child can be located and promptly reuni reunited with their parents. Isn't this basic? But what we hear from advocates in the media is that the administration's handling of this reunification process is a mess. We're at a real risk of lost children, lost in a bureaucratic system, adrift in a bureaucratic sea, who are delayed for how no who knows how long from seeing their parents again. That's because this was done so quickly, without any real thought to the impact it would have on the children, the impact it would have on their mothers and dads, and the impact it has on the image of the United States around the world. The Trump administration needs to make an immediate priority to ensure that children that separated from the parents are brought back together again quickly. Over the weekend, the Department of Homeland Security said that the federal government, quote, knows the location of all children in its custody and is working to reunite them with their families. I question that, but I accept it. And if it is true, there is no excuse for delay. No law required the administration to separate these families, and we don't need any new laws to be passed in this chamber to reunite them. We just need this administration to act and we need Congress to exert its oversight to verify that the administration is doing what it promised. I've worked for most of my Senate career to pass bipartisan legislation to fix our broken immigration system. Time and again, partisan, bipartisan efforts supported by a majority of Americans have been blocked by a minority of vocal Republicans. We brought a bill to the floor. I worked for six months with Senator John McCain and six other colleagues to write a comprehensive immigration reform bill, which we brought to the floor of the Senate and passed with an overwhelming vote. It would have cured this problem and many others. The House of Representatives refused to even consider it. Yesterday, I sat down with several of my colleagues, Republicans and Democrats, to discuss whether we can find a way to pass a law or state a policy to stop the administration from separating families in the future. I'm always happy to sit down on a bipartisan basis, roll up my sleeves and try to write a law that might serve the purpose of making this a better country, curing a problem we face, and do it with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle. But Pennsylvania Avenue is a two-way street, and over the past few days, President Trump has made statements about immigration reform that do not help at all, and I believe are contrary not only to the law and our Constitution, but to the values of our country. Last Friday, President Trump said that Republicans should stop, quote, wasting their time on immigration until after we elect more senators and congressmen and women in November. Also on Friday, he said the stories of children separated from their parents were, quote, phony. Phony. I've seen these kids. These aren't phony kids and they aren't phony stories. On Sunday, the president quoted, tweeted, and I quote, 
We cannot allow all of these people to invade our country. When somebody comes in, we must immediately, with no judges or court cases, bring them back from where they came. That was the president's tweet. Statements like that in the president's tweet make a mockery of our Constitution and its solemn guarantee of due process of law. The due process clause of the Constitution just doesn't apply to citizen. It applies to all people in the United States. The idea of abandoning due process when people seek asylum at our borders and having, as the president said, no judges or court cases is antithetical to the Constitution and its principles. I'll continue to work in good faith with my colleagues to see what Congress can do. But as long as President Trump is listening to advisors like Stephen Miller and making statements like these, it is hard to see how any bipartisan agreement can be reached on immigration. While Congress works on this issue, the administration has a moral obligation to immediately re reunite all families they've separated under that zero tolerance policy. They also have to make it clear that the president's executive order last week will continue to be followed and they will not separate any more families. The third thing that we clearly, clearly need to do is to find a way for those who present themselves at the border to be brought to their hearings in a timely fashion to determine whether they're eligible for asylum. It's that basic. And we don't have to detain them for long periods of time to achieve that. We know there are three ways to get over 90% of these people to the hearings as scheduled. Number one, provide them with the advice of legal counsel. Number two, provide them with management, case management of Lutheran services, Catholic services, and others that are willing to counsel them and work with them and tell them what the legal system in America requires. And third, in extreme cases, ankle monitors. Over 90% of people show up for hearings with those three basic things. We don't need to build multi-million dollar detention facilities and internment camps for these families. For goodness sakes, we can do this in a humane and constitutional way. Then we need to address some root causes of this is issue. On Friday in Chicago, the regional head of the Drug Enforcement Agency came by to sit down with me. And we talked about the flow of opioids, and the flow of heroin and the flow of fentanyl into my state of Illinois. Mr. Chairman, or Mr. President, I'm sure it's true in Ohio as it is in Illinois. There is no town too small and no suburb too wealthy not to be hit by this drug epidemic that we're currently facing. I learned, and I was shocked to learn, that on any given month, 2,000 pounds of fentanyl come into the city of Chicago. 2,000 pounds. And the Drug Enforcement Agency is lucky to intercept 20 or 30 pounds. The rest of it is going to be consumed and distributed from that city. Where is a lot of it coming from? From the cartels in Mexico. It isn't the people from Honduras at the border that pose the threat to America's security, not nearly as much as this drug epidemic. And keep in mind that it's a two-way street in this drug epidemic. Not only are these Mexican cartels sending these drugs to the United States, killing our kids and killing our neighbors and friends, we are sending back to them laundered drug money and guns so these cartels can take control in Mexico, in Honduras, in El Salvador, in Guatemala. And when these gangs take control and threaten the lives of people, they flee to the United States looking for protection. It's an endless circle that should be broken by broken, breaking the supply of drugs coming to this country. Any other president would be sitting down with the leaders of Mexico, El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala addressing this drug issue head on. This president tweets about kids who he calls phony coming to our border. We need to have truly a meeting of Central American and North American leaders to discuss this drug problem and all the problems it's creating, not only in their country, but in ours. And we also need to move forward and pass the DREAM Act. I've been trying for a long time here, almost 17 or 18 years now, to pass the law which will allow those who are brought to this country as children a chance to earn their way into legal status. Almost 90% of Americans support it. We need to pass it here. And finally, 
I haven't given up on comprehensive immigration reform. For goodness sakes, we see these problems every day, piecemeal problems, one at a time, trying to address one here and one there. Isn't it time we take a look at the whole immigration system, concede that we cannot accept everyone from all over the world who wants to come? We just can't open our borders for everyone. We need security at our borders, but we also need a clear and humane system when it comes to dealing with the current border crisis. I hope this is a goal that even some Republicans can agree on. And it doesn't take a new law to first reunite these kids with their parents and to take a positive step forward. Let's get this done. Before the 4th of July, let's reunite all 2,300 of these children with their parents so we can have the peace of mind that we are dealing with this in an American way.